Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wolfgang Danzbe Gruber. I am the director of the Liechtenstein Institute on Self-Determination at Princeton University. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to the inaugural lecture in the new series at the Liechtenstein Institute on women, peace, and security. And I do so in the name of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and in the name of Princeton University. We are very pleased that uh, the Liechtenstein Institute, in conjunction with the permanent mission of the Principality of Liechtenstein to the United Nations, is um, organizing this, um, um, in my eyes, most relevant um, new series of um, lectures, of activities, and of publications. And in the um, tradition of Princeton University, and in, the, uh, um, in uh, trying to lift the um, motto of Princeton University, Princeton in the nation service and in the service of all nations, um, this lecture series adds a specific dimension, and that is it has been, for the last two decades, the um, key issue of the Liechtenstein Institute at Princeton University to consider the uh, dimensions of self-determination, not just from a state and community-based perspective, but really to do so on the notion of determine your own destiny. And uh, I personally had to live conflictual situations in southeastern Europe, or the Balkans, the Caucasus, in Central Asia, and in Southwest Asia, and in the Middle East. And it goes without saying that at the end of the day of any of these conflicts, the individual, man, woman, and child, carries the brunt of the problem. And um, this is for me very much an element of determining your own destiny. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, together with my colleague Dr. Beth English, we could develop a whole dimension of, to paraphrase Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, of the other 50%. I sometimes believe they even more than 50% of the world's population, uh, namely um, the role of women in crisis management, in diplomacy, in negotiation of peace and stability. But most importantly, obviously, uh, as long as there have been armed conflicts and wars, it was so many, many times and under so uh, horrendous circumstances that women and children carry the brunt of both the receiving end of being victims, but sometimes also even of being specific targets, or uh, being in the role of what I um, just mentioned before in the conversation, in the role of price. Um, and um, for this purpose, I'm delighted that, uh, and for these dimensions, I'm delighted that uh, we begin this series. And um, it's for us um, particularly important that uh, this flows into all kinds of activities here at the Woodrow Wilson School and at Princeton University and beyond, namely also to educate um, the next generation and not only um, uh, ladies, uh, but also particularly to make. Uh, uh, male leaders uh, in military, in governmental affairs, in business, and in non-governmental organizations, every of that. With all this, I am delighted to welcome you to that uh, opening um, lecture and the ensuing uh, discussion, and I turn over the floor to uh, Dr. Bess English. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Beth English and I'm the director of the program on women in the global community at the Lichtenstein Institute on Self-Determination at Princeton. I would like to welcome you to what I'm sure will be a thought-provoking session with um, a, an eminent feminist scholar, Professor Cynthia Enlow. And um, she is currently a research professor at Clark University in Worcester, Mass. 
Um, her uh, very um, storied career uh, includes many accolades, in, uh, including uh, two Fulbrights, as well as guest professorships in Japan, um, in Britain, and in Canada. Um, among her 13 books, which have been translated into numerous languages, um, are Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, Making Feminist Sense of International Politics, Maneuvers, The International Politics of Militarizing Women's Lives, and most recently, The Real State of America, Mapping the Myths and Truths about the United States. Um, among her many honors, she has been awarded the International Study, Studies Association's Susan Strange Award, as well as the Peace and Justice Studies Association's Howard Zinn Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, Professor Enloe's research has focused on women's roles in economic markets, in world conflicts, in globalization, and in power politics. And importantly, her research also addresses how broader dynamics and events shape and are shaped by the day-to-day -day realities of women's lives. Her focus on the numerous roles that ordinary, if you want to call them, that women play um, in the international system and the global political economy really speaks well to what Professor Don Speckgruber was talking about in terms of this idea of um, sort of individual or personal sovereignty, individual self-determination, determining one's own destiny. And it's within that kind of context that the Lichtenstein Institute's project on women in the global community examines women's participation in the international system with the idea that we can, through study, address key issues um, challenges and promises of women's empowerment as leaders, as economic actors, as peacemakers, um, as well as equal citizens within the global community. For some background, um, in partnership with the Lichtenstein Mission to the United Nations, as well as the Peace Women Project, um, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the Institute is hosting this um, series through the academic year on issues related to the implementation of the UN's Women, Peace, and Security Agenda. And this has been, um, this, this Women, Peace, and Security Agenda has been um, built up over the past decade, and we'll hear more about that in a moment. Um, and it is a very, um, it is a very ambitious uh, agenda. Um, and it's considered to be one of the great achievements of the UN Security Council. Having said that, the implementation of the agenda has really lagged very far behind the sort of ambitious conceptual framework um, that, that has been built. And so the idea of this, um, of this lecture series is to have that discussion about how to best implement um, the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, what are its successes, what have been some of its failures, and how to, how to sort of bridge the gap. Um, Professor Enlo today will share with us her thoughts on the gendered nature of militarization and the impacts of armed conflict on women's lives, which obviously have very, um, uh, very key ramifications for the issue of women, peace, and security. Um, before turning the floor over um, to Professor Enlo, I would also like to introduce two of my colleagues and um, co-organizers of, of this series. Um, first, Mr. Swen Dornig. Uh, from the permanent mission of Lichtenstein to the United Nations, as well as Maria Butler, who is the director of the Peace Women Project of the Women uh, of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Uh, Mr. Dornig uh, represents the um, Lichtenstein mission in several United Nations groups of friends, including the Friends of Women, Peace, and Security. And he's going to provide us a very brief overview of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, just to give us um, a bit of context before uh, Professor Enlo then um, talks uh, more specifically. Uh, Maria uh, leads the monitoring, monitoring, advocacy, and outreach work of Peace Women's UN office in New York, and she um, will kindly be uh, moderating the Q&A and providing some final comments. So um, please welcome uh, Mr. Dornig, and um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Beth. Uh, I would also like to take the opportunity to uh, very briefly welcome you on behalf of the Permanent Mission of Liechtenstein to this first of a series of lectures devoted to the implementation of the uh, Women, Peace and Security Agenda of the Security Council. 
Um, as Beth already mentioned, uh, this lecture series is a joint project between the Liechtenstein Institute of Self-Determination here at Princeton University, the Peace Woman Project of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and the permanent mission of the Principality of Liechtenstein to the United Nations in New York. Um, as some of you might be aware of, uh, the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is uh, among one of the most important foreign political goals of, of Liechtenstein and certainly a uh, top priority of our Foreign Minister, Dr. Oya Frick. Um, and since the adoption of the first resolution on the topic, 1325, uh, we have therefore supported and initiated uh, various projects to move the implementation of the agenda forward. Among the most recent projects are the so-called uh, monthly action points on women, peace and security. And I'm happy that Sarah Taylor from the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security is here with us with the author of the so-called MAPS. And the, the goal of the MAPS is basically to provide uh, members of the Security Council on a monthly basis with really very hands-on specific recommendations on how to mainstream the thematic agenda on Women, Peace and Security Council, on Women, Peace and Security and the, really, the country-specific work of the Security Council. Uh, along with Switzerland, uh, we supported the publication of a handbook on women, peace and security, which has uh, been published by Peace Woman and will soon be available in its uh, second edition. And what the handbook does is basically makes the whole complex agenda of the whole um, of the, of the framework more and more accessible, more accessible on the go. What we also conceived is basically a mobile application for smartphones, and the mobile application combines the handbook and the monthly action points and is available from the App Store, so if you go with your iPhones online and downloaded it, then you will have a great overview of the agenda and basically uh, yeah, a device, something you can take, take with you every day. So the lecture series we're launching today is uh, part of our continued commitment to push the implementation of the agenda forward. And before I give the floor to our distinguished speaker, Professor Enlow, uh, I would like to emphasize uh, the need for having this lecture by providing you with a very, very brief overview of the agenda and its current state implementation. So the first resolution of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, Resolution 1325, uh, was anonymously adopted um, by the Security Council 12 years ago on the 31st October 2000, following a very long and intensive lobbying work by international women's rights organizations that were supported by UN organizations such as UNIFEM and by member states such as Namibia, Bangladesh and Canada. So the resolution was based up on a number of very already existing relevant uh, United Nations instruments, including the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, and the 1995 Beijing Platform, Beijing Integration and Platform for Action. And with the adoption of uh, Resolution 1325, the Security Council, for the first time, really specifically acknowledged the negative effects of armed conflict of women and girls, and the resolution aims to overcome the one-sided view of women as victims of armed conflict and emphasizing their decisive role in preventing, conflict, uh, preventing conflicts and of course also consolidating peace. So, so what happened since then, since um, the first resolution was adopted? Well, in uh, 2000, uh, the resolution has been reinforced by Resolution 1820, which uh, basically recognized uh, conflict-related sexual violence as a war crime and threat to international peace and security in order to better coordinate the UN system's response to sexual violence and armed conflict, Resolution 1888, adopted in 2009, established the position of a special representative of the Secretary General on sexual violence and conflict, and under the Security Council Presidency of Vietnam, also in 2009, the Security Council passed Resolution 1998, which established um, basically a, 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 a which, which addresses most of the time the, the, the exclusion of women and their interests from peace processes and related institutions. And it also requests, and that's very important for our work, ongoing work in the UN, it also requests the Secretary General to develop a set of indicators that basically tracks the implementation of 1325. On the uh, 10th anniversary of uh, Resolution 2025 in 2010, the Council adopted Resolution 1960, which creates institutional tools to, to, to strengthen accountability and combat impunity on conflict-related sexual violence, and it thereby passes the so-called, uh, or mandates the monitoring, analysis, and reporting arrangements on conflict-related sexual violence, which um, is currently included into the mandate of various UN resolutions. So along with a number of um, presidential statements, these five resolutions um, basically form the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. 
However, um, 12 years after the adoption of the agenda, its implementation uh, is still lagging. Sexual violence continues to be used as a method of warfare and as a tool to continue acts of war long after guns have gone silent. Women continue to be excluded from the peace table. And according to the last report of the Secretary General on implementation 1325 of the nine peace agreements signed in 2010, only two contain specific women peace and security provisions. So this is basically the same low percentage as in 2010. And not a single woman has yet been assigned as a lead peace mediator in UN lead peace processes. So this missing gender expertise at the peace table most of the time leads to peace accords that fail to ensure the engagement of women in post-conflict governments and thereby neglect the access to economic opportunities, justice and reparation. And it's exactly for this reason that the actual impact of the Women, Peace and Security agenda is widely debated by scholars and practitioners. Some argue that due to the overwhelming lack of political will, organization, inter alia, and discriminating attitudes, the establishment of the Women, Peace and Security agenda has, in the end, made little difference in strengthening women's interest. Others are more optimistic and emphasizing the recent number of references to the agenda and the formal UN discourse on security consequently preventing the attempt of some member states to avoid addressing women's needs and experience in conflict management. On the whole, I would argue that the adoption of 1325 is uh, certainly a remarkable development and it's an expression of the changing attitude of the Security Council towards a broader understanding of the concept of security. So with the adoption of the four new Women, Peace and Security resolutions and various pre presidential statements over the last four years, we now have the framework in place to ensure the participation of women in peace processes and post-conflict reconstruction, to better protect women from conflict-related sexual violence, and to address their needs through our humanitarian relief efforts in complex emergencies. However, uh, we have to keep in mind that the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is a work in progress, and the biggest challenge ahead of us is now the implementation of its framework. So the lecture series we have conceived with our partners shall contribute to this implementation. And on that note, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker of the lecture series, Professor Anna. Thank you uh, very much. It's uh, lovely being back here at Princeton on this beautiful fall day. Um, and um, also, I want to say a special thank you to the people of WILP, that's the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom which has both U.S. branches, but also an international office um, at the United Nations. And the mission of Liechtenstein, which is very forward-thinking and very imaginative in their um, engagement with uh, the implementation of 1325, um, and to the Institute itself uh, for um, helping to sponsor and launch this uh, series, the rest of which I'm sure will be quite wonderful. Um, when um, I was approached to take part in the series. Um, I really tried to think what I might have to offer because this morning we had a very interesting discussion in New York um, and the room was full of people who have very hands-on, very gritty, I would say, um, knowledge about um, what um, UN Security Resolution 1325, and if you don't know that language, Learn it, 1325, <laughs> right? Which is not, I mean, how many of you who are from the United States would ask 10 people on the street what 1325 was and they'd think it was a parking ticket or something? Um, that is, it's got no visibility in the United States um, except for very um, good um, uh, good work. Yes, absolutely. That's why we love blackboards. Well done. So do right. I. Yes, right, we love blackboards. Um, but it is one of the real problems is that most uh, Americans, even those who are very committed to the United Nations being an effective um, vehicle for uh, international peace, uh, even those Americans really don't know about this um, groundbreaking and historic uh, resolution that commits not only the United Nations, but every single member state to take account of and try to prevent um, wartime and militarized violence against uh, women, but also, and Sven mentioned the second part of it, which is at least as radical, radical means good, at least as radical, because radical means going to the root. That's all radical means, right? So going to the root of things. The second part of 1325 is to commit every government member of the United States 
and every agency in the United Nations to ensuring that women have a voice, an effective voice, not a token voice, not somebody's wife, but actually somebody that comes out of grassroots women's organizing, that those women activists have a voice in the creating of peace accords and in the implementation of peacekeeping and peace building in the post-war, when it comes, in the post-war era. That, in some ways, is as difficult to get states and officials um, to take seriously as is the prevention of violence against women. The prevention of violence against women, while many people, in fact, give lip service and they don't really take action to prevent it, and we know this on many campuses in the United States as well, um, but at least it kind of fits the um, sexist notion that women need protection, right? I mean, that's one of the problems of it. If you leave 1325 at women need protection, oh yes, right? It doesn't mean that the protection will happen, but it kind of fits the worldview if you think of women as those who need protection, women who are the vulnerable ones. And it's usually lumped together as women and children, one word, right? That that kind of view, while it is hard to provide the protection, so it doesn't mean that because it fits the sexist worldview, it's easy to implement. But much more difficult for people to really take on board is that women are thinkers, women are strategists, women are activists, women have grassroots organization um, uh, constituencies, and as such, they need to, in fact, be at the peace table. They need to be hammering out the accords. They need to be there in the constitutional assemblies that create the new constitution that oftentimes comes after um, civil wars. They need to be part and parcel of those who are building the new police forces, sometimes called security sector reform. If you're involved in this kind of work, you've got to kind of learn the formal lingo, right? Um, but when you hear security sector reform, that means police forces. And women have to be involved in the building um, and training and mandating of new police forces. They need to be part and parcel of the new judiciary. They need to be everywhere. That part of 1325 is, in fact, much more upsetting of the current status quo. And so whenever you listen to people talking, as Sven so wonderfully did here, about 1325, make sure you don't let them stop with the protection part. It doesn't, again, mean that they will take responsibility for providing that protection and for stopping those men who engage in the perpetration of sexual violence, but it does leave them with their comfortable worldview as to where women are. That is, they are the vulnerable ones. Don't let them get away with that. Now, one of the reasons that 1325 has set off so much new research, so much new activism, so much new thinking and really um, work that is being shared between activists and researchers, people in the foreign services of various countries, as well as women in NGOs like the UN um, uh, Working Group. Um, one of the reasons it's so valuable is that it has made us pay more attention to this thing called post-war. And I promised I would not spend too much time at the blackboard, but I love blackboard. Oh, so don't, don't worry. Um, we don't know very much about war, to tell you the truth, even though there are so many memoirs, there are so many books, there are so many um, very good documentary films by Abigail uh, Disney and others. Uh, we still don't know really enough about how women experience wars, very particular wars. The Chechen War, the Kosovo War, the Congo War, World War II. It's amazing what we still don't know about World War II, by the way. Um, we still don't know a lot, but, um, and we don't, we definitely don't know about this time, the gendering of this time called pre-war. Pre-war, you only know you're in pre-war until you're in war, right? Pre-war isn't something you know you're in until the war breaks out, that is the armed conflict um, breaks out. But what we're now learning from many scholars in many countries, and I'm um, very indebted to, for instance, women in Japan, feminist scholars in Japan, who are doing terrific work about Japanese women in the 1930s, for instance. 
These are very anti-militarist Japanese um, scholars who are doing very innovative work about where women were um, in the 1930s, Japan's pre-war. And what we're learning from scholars all over the world um, is that the pre-war time is a time of a, an attempt to position women as wives, as mothers, as daughters, to position women, especially in those family roles, as in a way that they will see their own contribution to their families and their contribution to society in terms of supporting a coming wartime effort. <coughs> so it's the definition of who's the patriotic mother, uh, who is the dutiful daughter. These are very powerful ideas. Um, who is the good wife? That those positions get militarized. That is, the idea that the good wife is the wife that encourages her husband to do his military duty and to stand by him when he does it. Right? That's a militarized wife. And that kind of work, which happens in the media, which happens through the government, that kind of work happens in the pre-war times. And so for any of you who are really interested in doing historical research, um, do look at the 10 years prior to any outbreak of actual armed violence. And watch the ways in which very particular groups of women, and that means you always have to ask about women in different social classes. You always have to ask in different countries about women in different ethnic groups and different racialized groups. You know, Don't just treat women as if they are monolithic. But ask about the ways in which they have been pressured to take on these militarized ideas of the good daughter, the dutiful daughter, um, the good wife, and the patriotic mother. What is interesting from what we know from a number of societies is how many women resist that. So that if you look at the outbreak of the war in the Balkans um, in the in 1991-92. One of the things that would strike you is the number of women who said they would resist being the good, yes, being the good um, mother by encouraging their, their sons to become willing conscripts into an increasingly chauvinistic um, uh, Milosevic uh, agenda. So to look at the pre-war doesn't mean that women are always putty in the hands of the militarizers. It means you ask the question, and then you ask who was able to resist, and who, in fact, felt actually complimented. Who felt as though, for the first time, they were part of something bigger, um, that they weren't just domestic creatures, by being asked to be the patriot, by being asked to be the supportive uh, wife or the dutiful daughter. Um, and those enticements um, are quite um, um, profound for a lot of women, and that's why militarization can take hold um, in women's lives, even if those women have no desire to ever pick up a weapon, have no um, desire to really be on the front line, but they become militarized. Um, so militarization happens to, if you will, a lot of good people. And it happens, if you take all the people in the world, I think, who are militarized, a majority of the people in 2012 who are militarized are civilians. Because they're militarized, they, we, let's not leave ourselves out of this, any one of us is militarized insofar as we begin to adopt for ourselves certain values and certain beliefs about um, who's the enemy, about whether hierarchy is the best way to organize, um, whether it's about um, men being the protectors and women being the grateful protected, that's very crucial to militarization of your life, um, that militarization really happens at individual levels insofar as you begin to adopt these world views. You can adopt one or two of them and not be totally militarized, um, but uh, increasingly as you adopt all those world views, including um, that violence, the wielding of violence, actually resolves problems, which is a major belief within the militarized uh, world view. Um, you can become militarized. Now, having said that, what we are now working hard on is to understand, we, that's you, me, and all of us, right? Uh, uh, 
and that is this thing called post-war. And this is where 1325 comes from. Right put down the chalk, or I'll just right away. Um, what we are now realizing, and it is thanks to um, groups like the Working Group and like WILP and the work that's going on here at Princeton at the Liechtenstein Center, what we now realize is that post-war is defined by war. Post-war isn't the equivalent of peace. Post-war is any era, and it can last a short time or a very, very long time. That post-war is that time when we reorganize our understandings of ourselves and our relationships with others and our relationships with the political system um, as referenced by the war that supposedly was just over. Now, 1325 is really one of the things it is, makes it so historic is that it is a resolution about the creation of a new kind of post-war. It is 1325, amongst many other things, is an attempt, an international attempt, to change the relationships between women and men, and women and men and political systems in this thing called the post-war, so that the post-war will really end and will become peacetime. Or put it the other way. If one doesn't, if one doesn't really profoundly change the relationships between the meanings of masculinity and the meanings of femininity, what the standards are for being seen as manly, what are the criteria in any society for being accepted as a respectable woman, if one doesn't change those, then the peace accord can be signed. Some weapons might even be handed in. A good part of various militias might even be demobilized. All signs that the war is ended. But if the ideas of manliness and the ideas of the respectable woman, always in quotes, um, are not profoundly changed, you have left there the seedbed for the next war. You have left in place um, the makings of remilitarization. Because remilitarization uh, depends on ideas about manliness, ideas about the good woman. And if those are left in place, then in fact um, the post war remains the post war. It doesn't look, it doesn't feel like, it isn't in reality peace. Now, to try and get a lot of people to take seriously. This kind of gender analysis is not easy. I'm sure a lot of you have tried. You've tried with your own families, maybe with your roommates, uh, and maybe with your coworkers. To get people to take seriously gender analysis is not easy. People either think you are some, I don't know, women's studies major thing. <laughs> I, mean, I think, since I spent a lot of long time not being a feminist, um, I was never an anti-feminist, but I, you know, I spent a long time. I went to University of California at Berkeley, which is supposedly really radical in the 60s when I was there. Um, but actually, um, I really didn't become a feminist until my until mid-70s. I was slow, way, way slower than you all. Um, but what I now realized was that, and I, this is embarrassing, I wrote a lot. I mean, you know, I published books and things. Um, which Beth was very nice not to mention because they're all pre-feminist efforts, right? And I kind of like, you know, I kind of like them. I mean, you know, I'm not totally embarrassed by them. Um, but but I, I look at them now and I think I am a bit embarrassed because I think they're naive. That is, I think before I was pushed by a lot of friends who are much smarter than I am to do gender analysis of the things I said I was interested in, which I'm interested in militarism, I'm interested in war, and militarism is much bigger than war, and I'm interested in militaries as organizations and the roles they play in all our country's lives. I'm interested in all of that. And I was interested in all of that. But I tried to understand each of those things. I tried to understand war, I tried to understand militaries as institutions, um, and I tried to understand militarism as a package of ideas. 
without any gender analysis. And you, you can do it, but I think you end up unreliable. So one of the things that really happened to me as I was pushed by friends and students to become much more feminist in my questioning, not my answers, my questions, um, what happened to me was I think I got, I actually got smarter. That is, I got, meaning not that I'm smart, I was more useful. I, I became more realistic by um, asking gender questions. So um, you here at Princeton, I'm sure, are skilled in gender analysis, um, and you should be. Um, but gender analysis means you should be able to do a gender analysis of anything, anything. You should be able to do a gender analysis of C-SPAN. You should be able to do a gender analysis of Princeton. You should be able to do a gender analysis of any of the clubs or associations that you are active in. You should be able to do a gender analysis of any workplaces that you uh, have work um, in. You should be able to do a gender analysis of anything, um, including, we were talking this morning, you should be able to not, not do the full thing, but you should be able to know how to start doing a gender analysis of the Hurricane Sandy. And you should be able to, because that was a major disaster in the way that a war is a major disaster for a lot of people in New Jersey and Queens and Manhattan. And if you think you are gearing up to do gender analysis, start at home. See what it questions, not that you have all the answers. See what questions you would ask if you had the chance to do a, you know, a collaborative uh, gender analysis of um, the Hurricane Sandy that hit the, um, the American East Coast uh, two weeks ago. How, what questions would you ask? And who would you ask them of? So gender analysis is a useful skill. It's a really, it's a skill that makes you more realistic. Now, when you start talking about post-war, what does that mean? It means that if you're going to really think seriously about how to get women more um, involved um, in um, the implementation of peace accords and in the um, implementation of what UN missions say that they are really obligated to do. How do you go about doing that? And let me give you an example of what a non-gender analysis of a very good project looked like in Afghanistan. And this was a study done by a German NGO, which had um, really put a lot of very good effort into um, radio programming. They really realized that in Afghanistan, two things, amongst others, and that is that there is um, a high level of illiteracy amongst women, especially rural women, but they also realized that there was a gap between men's illiteracy and women's illiteracy. Whenever you look at illiteracy data, actually I'd say whenever you look at any data, always ask for the gender dis dis um, disaggregation. And don't trust any data about things called children. There are boys and there are girls. And they don't necessarily experience not only schooling, but they don't experience cal calorie intake. They don't experience all kinds of things the same way. Um, and there are no such thing as parents. There are mothers and there are fathers, and they don't experience parenting the same way. This isn't good or bad. This isn't creating hierarchies is becoming realistic about how people live their lives so that if you try to be of any use, you are of useful use, if you will. So this very good German um, NGO really was conscious of the high level of illiteracy in uh, Afghanistan, particularly in the rural areas, and they had done some gender analysis. Not enough, but they had done, they had done some gender analysis and they realized that radio was going to be really crucial for women since their illiteracy in the rural areas was even higher than rural Afghan men's. So far, so good, right? Second thing is that they had really put effort behind creating women's programming, uh, using mainly uh, women who they trained and were already um, skilled in radio work in Kabul, but they created programs around health and about rights and around family law. And so they had created these programs and they wanted to help um, 
uh, people in the rural areas have access to this information, not by the printed word, but by radio. So far, so good? So three levels of gender analysis. But he, so they sent out the, these programs. They particularly um, put them um, out um, so they had long range, so they reached to remote, remote um, villages in Afghanistan. And then they began to hear that women in the rural areas had no idea these programs existed. They, they even put it out in several languages, in Pashtun and Dari, right? They didn't just assume one, you know, hegemonic dominant language. Um, but they were hearing that women in the rural areas, because they did visit, um, actually had no knowledge of the program, had never heard of the programs, these programs that they put so much effort into. Why? Because now the good thing is they got curious, right? That's always the good news. Um, they got curious, and so they began to do what they should have done at the start. They began to do an ethnographic that's close to the ground, stay around, watch, and listen. Not easy in, easy out, you know? Stay around, listen, watch. And what they realized they had never asked is, what is the gendering of the radio in households? And amongst the things they found is that the radio, of course, is one of the prized possessions in a household that doesn't have very much materially. So who gets control of the radio if it's a prized possession? It's the person who is considered most important in the household which tended to be the adult man in the household. Second of all, where was the radio put? Right? It was put on a shelf, a high shelf. right? And it was only turned on, again, you have to stick around now to do gender analysis. It was only turned on when the man in the household had <coughs> a program that he thought was important to listen to. And then the radio was taken down he chose the place on the dial where the radio would be turned to, and then he would listen, and only he and his male friends in the neighborhood, because not everyone had radios, gathered around to listen. If the women listened at all, they were supposed to be not listening. They were supposed to be at their chores, which was their job. Um, and so if they heard anything, it was literally by eavesdropping on the radio program. Most of the radio programs that the men in the household wanted to listen to had nothing to do with women's health, nothing to do with women's rights, nothing to do with women's involvement in politics. They were programs that the men decided that they thought was interesting. Now, why this is such a good story to remember is to remind ourselves that being a half-baked gender analyst is not enough. And it means that you've got to be genuinely curious about what are the dynamics at the micro level. And the micro level can be within an NGO or it can be within a, a rural household. You have to be really curious about the relationship between men and women and ideas about the masculinization of importance, the masculinization of news. The, nas the masculinization of information, not to mention the masculinization of the most prized possession in the house. Um, and to give the, the NGO credit, they did, they were curious, they did stick around, and they did write up their findings that were essentially findings of their failings. Right? But it was a very good wake up call, I thought, for um, you can't just say you take 1325 seriously, both the protection of women and the involvement of women in a really serious fashion. You can't just take those seriously unless you are also gender curious. And gender curious means you've got to devote time, which most of us don't have a lot of, time and resources, which are always scarce, to do gender analysis or, in fact, even your well-meaning efforts to shape the post-war will fail. I'll give you another example, and this is one that a lot of the wonderful women who are doing lobbying around 1325 and are making the efforts to get it uh, implemented 
know about, and that is about the efforts in very recent months to try and get the gender dynamics of guns taken seriously um, in post-conflict societies. Probably be good if they were being taken in seriously in every society. Um, and what the gender analysts have found, well, first of all, it's usually rejected. That is, people who are doing small arms and light weapons, and that's the term usually used, small arms and light weapons, um, uh, and again, well-meaning. They want to have fewer guns in circulation. Um, they know that the wider circulation of um, guns there are, the more likely is that post-war will last forever and peace will never come, and that a new conflict could break out. So they've got all that um, good commitments in place, but they don't believe, most of them, not all, most of them, don't believe that gender has anything to do with guns. That is, that owning a gun, possessing a gun, holding a gun, has anything to do with manliness. Which, and manliness is all in the mind, right? Uh, manliness is not about anatomy. Manliness is other people's perception of you and your perception of yourself. And we know from some of the failed efforts to get guns handed in after conflicts that in fact particularly young men who as teenagers went into militias and were handed guns and grew into manhood, if you will, with the notion that a gun gave them standing in society. They had to be taken seriously because they were the wielder of a gun. Why would a young man, particularly if he then has no chance for paid employment, he thinks, why would he four years later or five years later, at the age of 20 or 21, willingly give up the one thing that gave him any status? Well, that's gender analysis. If you don't take seriously masculinity, how can you possibly have an effective um, campaign to get men who are the main holders of guns to hand in their guns. If you think you can have a campaign to get gun collection um, widespread and not seriously think about manliness and its perceptions, you're on a losing cause. The second thing that is ignored by people who don't want to think seriously about um, limiting the number of guns in any post-war society is not to include women in any campaign for the collection of guns is depriving you of knowledge. And this is women from Mali who have been particularly activist about this. Um, Mali, the, the African uh, nation. Because um, they've said, and they've organized around this, and they've actually managed to persuade their government to some extent, that it's women who oftentimes know where the guns are. They are some of your best sources of where is the gun in the house hidden. Oftentimes because they have the greatest stake in knowing where the gun is because it's likely to be used to intimidate them. Guns are not just about the enemy out there. Guns are oftentimes, and just the wielding of it, not even the firing of it, are become part and parcel of the dynamics of domestic intimidation. So a lot of women have a stake in knowing where guns are in their household. If you don't include women as active thinking strategists and activists in a gun collection campaign, what you're doing is saying, well, there's a whole raft of knowledge here that we think we can do without. Well, what kind of campaign is that? Right? So that gender analysis matters so that you can have an effective post-war um, uh, uh, resolution so that post-war can turn into peacetime. Insofar as you do not, I do not, we do not, ask serious gender questions, which means you've got to have the resources to try and answer them. You can't just stand out in the village green and ask the question and be the oracle, right? You really, you have to know how to get organizations to help you implement the answering of the questions. Insofar as we don't ask those gender questions, we are going to leave ourselves hollowed. 
we'll leave ourselves working very hard and think we're people of goodwill, but we will have deprived ourselves of the kind of knowledge and the kind of participation we need to actually make post-war shorter rather than longer. Um, right now, um, in Syria, uh, as many of you know, um, there is an effort in the midst of a rampantly escalating militarized armed conflict in Syria. Right now, in the middle of that war, and this is something else to keep in mind, in the middle of the war is when this thing called the post-war is being created. So you cannot wait to the peace accord to start doing post-war analysis. In the middle of fighting is oftentimes where it is decided who will be the main players, the main decision makers in the post-war. So you all read the papers, you probably know this. In Doha, uh, the capital of Qatar, um, last week, um, there was a decision made to create an alternative, a new and hopefully more legitimate um, Syrian uh, national coalition, which is being referred to by many governments who played a part in getting all the factions together in Doha to create this new national coalition, is being referred to not just as a national coalition of um, opposition to uh, the Assad government, it's being referred to as the provisional government that will then be ready to take over governing Syria in the post-Assad, post-war moment. In the middle of war is the creation of a post-war provisional government. That's what was happening in Doha. So, how many women were elected to this? This is 12 years after 1325. This is not just the Qatar government making decisions. This is not even just the Syrian opposition making decisions. This is all the governments, including the United States government, um, taking very active part in these Doha, um, putting heads together, creating a new, more legitimate um, coalition that could stand as the provisional government to take over in the post-war era. So there, and I don't know the figures, some of you will know this better, I think there are about 40 members of the new national coalition. 60. 60. Oh, that's even better. Better meaning worse. <laughs> All right. You, you know. How many women? You know, yes, that's right. Okay, there's 60. <laughs> 60. 60. And this is 12 years after 1325. Every government that took part has signed on to 1325. This was a very public, this isn't a vague process, this is a very formal process. You could tell who was there, you could tell who was going to be elected. Out of 60, what would you guess be as the number of women who were elected to the new national coalition provisional government of Syria? Go on, be optimistic. Five. Got five. See, he is optimistic. There's the, there's the optimist in the room. One. 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 Twelve years after, one. One out of 60. So here's a question for everybody. So how did people let that happen? What was going on in their minds? I can assure you that every person that took part in these very loaded diplomatic um, processes in Doha, I can guarantee you that all of them would be able, if you shook their shoulder, to say kind words about 1325. Because it's their job, right? So the real question is, for all of us, is how did they manage to so marginalize, ignore, take no account of women in the midst of the most serious right now armed conflict that is engaging so many um, governments. I don't have the answer to that, but what I do know is that we better understand how sexism works. And it's not just about um, denying votes to 1325, they probably all voted for 1325. 
It's how you can give lip service. Lip service is a very interesting thing to study, right? Just like tokenism is very interesting to study. Um, and we have at work now um, a blatant um, example of paying lip service to a major UN resolution that they are all obligated to uh, abide by, and many of them voted for, um, and yet without seeming any embarrassment, um, to help negotiate a process that shut women out of the room. So I'm going to end at that point, and then we can have a good conversation. <coughs> yes, okay. Hi. Hi. First of all, thank you very much for a very stimulating uh, uh, presentation. And, uh, mic, please. Oh, yes, we, well, we need mics. We need mics. There you go. You're going to be the, oh, you're going to say something. Wait, let, oh, before no, Wolfgang, yeah, no, that's right. Well, jump ahead here. Yeah. I'll just uh, firstly thank Cynthia. I work for WILF, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And Cynthia's been a longtime member and influencer of our work. We're an old, we're almost 98 years old of a women's peace organization that was started of women uh, that came together to end World War I. You might know Jane Addams and her comrades. But it has continued, and the work continues not only at an international level, but really at a local level. Uh, our colleagues in Congo, for example, I was thinking of them when you were speaking, Cynthia, because they always say, why are we always talking about sexual violence here? But when I come to the US to speak at the UN, nobody says, why is the US government continuing to sell arms in the Eastern DRC, in the Congo. And these issues are critical to 1325. And it's why our organization was one of the uh, key organizations in 2000 that pushed for a feminist resolution, a resolution that was about ending war, not this phrase, making war safe for women. Mm -hmm. And it becomes key tool for our colleagues who are working in the middle of conflict situations, whether in Palestine, or in, or in the DRC, and indeed here in the US, the activists who are members of WILF are using 1325 to say this is not about instrumentalizing women in foreign policy. It's not about saving women in Afghanistan. This is about looking at our own policies in terms of uh, thinking about how is the US itself militarizing our own security. Let's use 1325 to redefine security, and Cynthia, has influenced so much our work and how we organize and how we advocate for 1325 to be a holistic tool. Uh, so many things came to my mind because one of our core challenges is talking about disarmament, Cynthia, and I think uh, this is something that often gets left off the agenda and we're so grateful for you to incorporating it into your work, is how we can ask the questions about arms, and feminism in the same paragraph. Because in the UN, that's a very difficult thing to do. And it becomes so critical that we break these silences. And that's why civil society, working with academia, and working with member states, really can show the, the way forward, I think. And this is one of the motivations for this series. We have about 30 minutes. And we want to open the floor for really interaction with you all. Uh, we just want to remind everyone that we are using the microphone because of the video, and please introduce yourself uh, before your remarks. Okay. Okay. Wolfgang, that's pretty good. Um, I uh, would like to um, bring um, to, uh, first of all, thank you very much for a really stimulating uh, um, uh, presentation, and um, no wonder you shaped contribute uh, to uh, an emerging field here but I wanted to uh, I wanted to um, ask you specifically um, where is the role of religion in the whole situation uh, where is the role of religion concerning the role of women in society uh, concerning the um, um, standing of women Uh, and uh, how do you square that question with regard to a generational uh, issue? And I would like to um, uh, help to clarify something, although I haven't been in Doha, but we have been, I was just in a meeting parallel to it. Um, to, in fairness, uh, 
the meeting as it took place, took place to the uh, majority of the time amongst the um, um, uh, various groups of Syria. And uh, the um, facilitating states really kept outside. Um, and um, I'm painfully aware uh, of uh, the point you raised. And in addition, if I would say where the one lady comes from, from which family, it even sort of, uh, um, uh, because it, but I have to be honest, uh, in a situation where we have bloodshed and uh, continuing destruction, um, and we are running against the time factor, even in concerning uh, climatic change. We have the winter coming into mm -hmm. Syria now, and you want you grasp any straw you can mm -hmm. get to bring about peace. Mm -hmm. uh, but that again does not excuse that there are not more women involved. Mm -hmm. So my question concerns religion the role of women and religion, and, religion yes. and also the generational perspective. Yes. Great, thank you very much. Take yes. a second one, and I'll try and. Question? Or thoughts or yeah. Or okay, no, stories. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the second year at the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, Hi. one of those funny women studies majors. You <laughs> now we call it smart. <laughs> and I had a question about there was a lot of media attention about a year ago on the large number of rapes female soldiers in the military. Oh yeah, in the US military. In the US military. And I wanted just to hear your because mm -hmm. there's a very interesting case of, of gender and militarism colliding Absolutely. between different sort of competing ideals. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on what what why attention was placed to this issue now and, and what has happened since it seems to have faded. Yes. Oh good. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about both. Um, let me talk a little bit um, about a little I know. I'm definitely not an expert on religion but about how to think about religion, gender analysis, women, and security. And that is, every, not every religion is monolithic, but every um, um, expression of religion is usually woven through with ideas about what the good woman is and what the good woman should be. And then you watch women in any religion in any religion, try to navigate that. For a lot of women, even though the religion, religious organizations that they um, affiliate with um, are highly patriarchal, and that's true of virtually every religion in the world, um, prominent religion in the world, I should say, established religion in the world, that doesn't mean that a lot, for a lot of women that their religious beliefs and even their religious participation in whatever is their local church or mosque or uh, synagogue or temple doesn't give them a sense of security. <coughs> and oftentimes, really, the male leadership of those organizations are perfectly aware that women's sense of security coming from a particular faith and the practice of that faith is one of the things that is sustaining that religious organization. Um, it has put many religious organizations really in conflict with each other, because on the one hand, they really absolutely depend on women as um, participants, um, who turns up at the temple, who turns up at the, at the church, who turns up at the synagogue, um, at the same time as the religious organization has been loathed to allow women to really wield influence in that religious organization. If you listen to um, Indian feminists talk about Hindu nationalism, you will hear a lot of these concerns. If you listen to a lot of African American women talk about churches in the United States, you'll hear these concerns. You will hear these concerns from Sisters in Islam, which is the uh, really wonderful um, uh, group in Malaysia talking about um, how to reinterpret the Koran so that women's um, uh, integrity is more full-fledged. So I think it's not really an answer to your question, but it does mean that we have a much bigger agenda if we are going to take religion seriously, is to watch how women engage with religion, both as uh, faith 
and as um, organized practice, and what kind of gender analysis, um, what would gender analysis show you about the practice of particular religions in particular places? I know from my um, Serbian feminist friends um, that there is an enormous alarm now in the reassertion of the Serbian Orthodox Christian Church in Serbian political life. There is also a lot of alarm amongst Russian feminists about the um, closeness of the Putin government to the um, Russian Orthodox Church now. So you have to watch over time. You have to listen really seriously to feminists in any country um, before you make um, assumptions. Um, but you have to be curious, and you have to be curious about how women live their religious lives or their non-religious lives, and you have to take seriously the gender dynamics within any religious organization. Um, the extent to which any church legitimizes militarism is always a question to ask. Always a question to ask. And there will usually be debates within religious traditions about the relationship of that religion and militarism. So listen for the debates as well. Your um, comment and your uh, reminding us of the importance of the, the importance of asking questions about the US military's own internal uh, sexual assault um, history um, is really crucial at this point. You were talking about why is only now an issue. The women I know who've been, who are lawyers and social workers for the most part, who really tried to be this, create a support network so that women who had stayed very silent inside the military, I don't know if any of you have had experience inside any military, but militaries, you know, are very, very highly um, um, hierarchical. Um, and um, most reporting about anything whether it be racism or sexism or actual assault, must go through what is called the chain of command, which is really deadening on any kind of sense of empowerment or protectiveness when you're making um, a complaint, especially one against a fellow soldier. And sometimes it is the commanding officer who is the perpetrator. Um, there is. So there has been an effort to try and make this into an issue now for at least eight years. What is interesting is to watch how hard it has been to make the sexual assault of American male soldiers on American female soldiers an issue. Because an issue, I'll try not to do my sort of politics 101 here, but an issue, we use the term issue a lot now, but I think it, we should be reminded it's a very particular thing. It is taking a phenomenon and making it problematic. So it, today, this is not to embarrass anybody too much. Today, um, it is not yet, well, maybe it is here at Princeton. I hope so. It's not too problematic to have brought a plastic water bottle to this event. But there are a lot of people who are trying to make us embarrassed about this, aren't there? Right? What are you doing, you know, using all this plastic to carry around water, right? So it is hard to make something that people take for granted into something that is problematic. The second thing about something becoming an issue is it has to be not only problematic, it has to be accepted as something that requires a public solution. So people might think certain things are problematic, but they don't want to make them something that is the public responsibility to solve. Getting those two things done, making male soldiers sexual assault of female soldiers in the US military seen as not just boys will be boys, and every language has the equivalent of boys will be boys. So to say that it's not just normal, it's not just natural, it's not just inevitable, it is problematic. That was then taking work. Then the thing is to get it up to the level where it's not just something that, that every woman should deal with herself. And that's the usual response that most commanders give most women who come to them 
saying, I was just sexually assaulted in the barracks or at the latrines. Um, that has been very hard to do. You get it up to be a public issue. It is true that some members of Congress, of the US Congress, have been persuaded now that it is a public issue. And that's what's new. So you have to get both those things in place. And it's taken about eight years. People don't want to hear it. Right? If you think that the main people who should hold the flag at your <coughs> local high school football game should be members of the military or members of the junior ROTC, that is, in military uniform, it, that makes it really hard to raise questions about sexual assault of soldiers on soldiers. That is, there's a lot of resistance in American culture for seeing, not all men by any means, but seeing any men wearing the country's uniform being sexual perpetrators. It's really hard. The fact that we've even gotten this far has a lot to do with the kind of organizing that women um, activists have been doing and how they have very savvily tried to find members of Congress who will take it seriously. And that has taken a lot of time. The film that you probably have heard about, but is worth watching, it's a documentary, it's called The Invisible War. And it's on DVD now. It came out about two years ago. Um, and it is both shows you how women themselves have experienced sexual assault, but it also talks about the thing that we know shapes so much of post-war, and that is silence. That is, why is it that women feel it is so much a part of their minimal security not to talk about what happened. And time and again, you have found the Pentagon being unwilling to change the chain of command so that uh, the complaints can be made. One of the things that Leon Panetta has done as Secretary of Defense is he has, he was persuaded partly by watching Invisible War and partly by these, which was made by activists. And he has now, for the first time ever, said that a woman making a complaint of sexual assault does not have to go to her immediate superior in her unit. And that won't, you know, open the floodgates to, you know, a reality check, but it is likely to mean that more women will feel somewhat less insecure by making the charges. Um, also, of course, all these complaints, there, there are very, very few convictions. And women in the military know this. So you think, okay, the main thing is get out. The main thing is just not reenlist. The main thing is get out and try to put it behind me. Yeah, any other thoughts or? Yeah, hi. I'm Alice, and I'm also an MPA here. Oh, great. Hi, Alice. Here. Um, so I have come here from a few years of work in development, international development, oh, primarily um, in countries where um, women are just not participating in the public sphere at all. So first, you know, coming at this work, I think I have two different concerns engaging. Number one, I think I, I come at it from a very value-loaded perspective, being an American woman in these contexts. So I think it's very hard to engage in the first place. And secondly, because I'm not sure about the role that international development really should or can play to change those dynamics. So it shouldn't be necessarily imposed from the outside. But if we move beyond those two dilemmas, major dilemmas, yeah, yeah. My question for you, I think, is how can international development actually kickstart the role of women in, in the public sphere in some of these countries? I'm thinking of Afghanistan with Jordan. Um, beyond merely like the token participation, mm -hmm. quota participation, yeah. whatever, um, when they've traditionally been marginalized and really not had any meaningful role in, in society and in, in a public way. Mm. That's a big question. Well, I, well, I, the, one of the good news things is, I think, that a lot more people who do this thing called international development work now actually ask that question. I mean, really, I can't tell you, well, you know this, it is such a big step when people ask a question they never thought they used to have to ask, right? And that doesn't sound like a big breakthrough, but it's actually a huge breakthrough. Um, and I think a lot of people in doing development work now, well, there are a lot more people that are what I would call feminist informed 
Uh, that is, they might call themselves a feminist, they might not, but they are feminist informed. And by that I mean that they not only ask gender questions, questions about masculinity and femininity, questions about men's lives and women's lives, they not only ask those questions, they ask about power. And that's really, for me, what means going beyond gender analysis to feminist analysis is you not only ask about masculinities at play and feminities at play, you ask what it does to power, the uses of it, the possession of it, the wielding of it. And in a lot of development work, it used to be that nobody asked questions about power. Now there is a, not, you've worked with a lot of people who still don't ask questions about power, but there are a lot more people that are asking questions. And I think the other thing that is going on, and you just mentioned Jordan and Afghanistan, is that there are women's organizing, there is women's organizing going on in countries where it may be the hardest to organize. And the best international development work I know of works with women's groups. And it doesn't mean that every women's group, you know, um, are angels. No American women's group is, you know, full of angels. Um, but it does mean that there is some authenticity there. And there is some real collaboration rather than, as you say, the kind of import model, right? Which then positions us as if we have no problems of sexual assault in our country's military, right? If the, the problem with the import model is it makes us dumb about ourselves. And we don't ask enough questions about how sexism works in our own society and why only 5% of all construction workers in the United States are women. Um, so I think working with local groups um, is really crucial and learning from them, right? Not just kind of finding them and thinking it's your ticket to legitimacy, but rather listening and be educated by them to change uh, uh, the ways of operating. But, you know, it's definitely, you know, the road is, you know, we're nowhere, we can't even see the end of the road in terms of this kind of, of work. Um, and hopefully, more and more women from outside affluent countries will be the drivers of international development, the drivers and informers of international development. Um, but it means that within every NGO or agency that's doing international development work, somebody should be doing a gender analysis of that organization. Where are the men in that organization? Where are the women? Who has influence in that organization? Who gets the technical expertise in that organization? Or my bottom line, because I've been taught by a lot of people who do this work, is who gets the land over? <laughs> right? um, so that the only way to do really gender-informed development work is to be gender-curious about the group you're working with or in. Not a total answer, but kind of a, just on the train with you. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Oh, good. Or we take two short ones. Great. Hi. Um, I'm sorry, but it's not just a question. Sure. I, mean, I have been following uh, the, the, the organization, the Women International League. Oh, yes. For 20 years. Ah, excellent. Uh, in Chicago. And uh, uh, when I came to Philadelphia, because we had an organization in Philadelphia, which yeah. is a cultural organization, um, I immediately wanted to join the league. I was very interested because I'm coming from Eastern Europe and in the communist women didn't have the problem of non-equality, but now we do. So, and I was very interested. And, and you, that organization, it's so weak. And my point to you is that in the last 10 years, there is no progress because the baby boomers, the fighters, the, the activists are of a certain age, our age, and they they lost ground. And unless you pick up fast, mm -hmm. all these changes will take mm -hmm. another 12 years. Mm -hmm. And that's my issue. I'm looking at campuses. I even made some comments yesterday to the uh, forum choosing the president. Mm -hmm. There is no activist in the campus. And that's the problem of this country. So my question to you is, you are a professor, so you are like I said, an activist. But what do you recommend in concrete, concrete terms 
to, to steer up. And thank you for, maybe you are the new leader, maybe things will change, but there is need of many men. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. That's a very good wake up. I must have teach us. Yeah. <laughs> Another young. Uh, good. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Brianna. Hi, Brianna. I am an undergrad, so I'm um, a senior year at Princeton, and I actually had the opportunity to intern with these women's project this summer, so this is very cool. Um, I that's just, how the new generation is being built. <laughs> um, I actually just I wanted to bring up an organization that I thought was uh, pertinent to both talking about the crisis in Syria and then additionally kind of the idea of post-war transitional justice being developed during wartime. Um, there's an organization called Women Under Siege um, Syria, and it's an arm of the Women's Media Center, and actually what they're doing is they're documenting instances. Say it all again so we really do. Sorry. Okay. Um, it's a project of Women's Media Center, and it's called Women, Syrian Women Under Siege. And what they're doing is they're documenting instances of sexual and gender-based violence that are occurring in Syria, um, specifically using crowdsource technology. So all of these are being categorized by degree of assault and by location, and they're all going onto a map. And they're being sent in through anonymous email by Twitter feed, um, so really it's kind of this tremendous harnessing of new technology to both give a voice to the victims in a sense that it's, uh, again, dealing with not, not just the idea of victimization, but the idea of giving, a, giving agency more survivors. Um, and also to kind of provide an opportunity for post-war transitional justice, because it's one of the first cases, I guess, of systematic rape and conflict where it's being documented in the, midst um, in the, in the moment. Um, so I thought, it kind of brings up an interesting point of how can we use technology, how can we use all of these resources that, that we take for granted for a more gendered discussion or gender analysis. Um, that's yeah, that's wonderful. Great. And it, it does speak to the first question because it says sometimes, you know, with each new generation, every new generation, you find your own ways to be active. And it may not be totally visible to a generation that isn't used to that kind of activism. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the activism that we're seeing in, if you will, the emergent generation of feminist activists isn't very visible to people, for instance, who aren't familiar with crowdsourcing or in, aren't familiar with Twitter. And so I think one of the things to do is to make sure that that is put out in other media so that people of other generations can see it. And one of the things for people who aren't used to that kind of technology is kind of open our eyes and look for other kinds of activism rather than imagine the activism that was most prevalent in our generation is the activism that is most effective or meaningful to this generation. Um, thank you all very much. On behalf of the co-sponsors, I want to sincerely thank Cynthia for opening our eyes and opening the conversation here with a new group of women activists and feminist activists that can be both men and women. And it started us uh, also talking about the interconnections between militarism, feminism, equality, development, technology and all the questions that have been raised have actually shown where the gaps are and where we need to continue working. Uh, this is really the start of a series where we want to open the conversation. Cynthia, you have done that in a wonderful and uh, exciting way for us. It's, more, it's really good for us to get outside the UN bubble where we talk in acronyms and to, to also ask about or learn about asking questions. And that's what I'm going to take away from the lecture today. What are the questions we're asking? Why are they important? And who are we asking them to? And I hope all of us can think about what is the gender analysis we're going to do. Cynthia gave us that challenge. We can take it in our own organizations, in our studies, in our Thanksgiving dinner next week. Um, and really take forward some of what you've heard today, whether it's joining a women's organization, reading Cynthia's uh, books, or getting involved in an activism campaign like the 16 Days, which is happening uh, on the 25th of this month. And the theme is militarism, challenging militarism from 
in the home to in the world. So you can take part in your communities, you can tweet about it from your computers, or you can join an organization that's doing local activism here in the US. So I want to sincerely thank our partners, and particularly Cynthia again.